Um, welcome to Huffington Post's uh, live book chat. Um, we are coming to you, I'm coming to you from our lovely HuffPost Washington Bureau, uh, just a stone's throw from the White House uh, where the weather is shockingly beautiful today and the pollen count is shockingly high, so I ask your indulgence uh, for an occasional sniffle and grunt over from my side over here. Um, my name is Dan Frumkin, I'm your host, I'm the senior Washington correspondent for the Huffington Post, and uh, up until recently bureau chief, and prior to that worked for the Washington Post uh, for quite a while, among other things, writing a column about the White House. Um, our very special guest today is Matthew Bishop, uh, who is the United States business editor for The Economist, and also the co-author uh, with Michael Green of a new book uh, that was uh, Ariana Huffington's Book of the Month pick. It is, how's that for product placement? The Road from Ruin. Um, I've, I've got to tell you, I uh, not only have, have you know, read uh, much of the book, but I, I did look at, at some of the reviews, and I don't think there was a single review that didn't use the word provocative. Uh, I believe that everybody has, has consistently agreed whether they agree with, uh, as to what, you know, whether they agreed or disagreed with, with, with the thrust of the book, that it was very provocative, it was intellectually uh, fascinating, and, and worth a read uh, no matter where you're coming from. Audience question, Matthew, how responsible has the Federal Reserve been in the current recession we're in? Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the many ways in which we got into a bubble, the bubble that's caused so much problems, was the Federal Reserve's um, difficulties in, in actually managing the economy over the period from about 1998 through to 2008, in that the Fed, um, every time it had an opportunity to uh, do what the Fed is supposed to do, which was famously described as just when the party gets really good, it takes the punch bowl away, uh, it didn't take the punch bowl away. It in fact cut interest rates or kept them low and actually was like bringing more wine and more punch to the party rather than actually taking it away. So I think the, the Fed performed pretty poorly. Um, Alan Greenspan was. Uh, you know, rightly worried, worried that he didn't have a mandate to raise interest rates so much that they would have burst the bubbles that were going on. On the other hand, um, he uh, when he's, he wouldn't actually admit there was a bubble in the economy. Uh, so he once spoke <laughs> about the possibility of, irration of irrational exuberance, and then he just said, well, I'm not going to mention that anymore, partly because I think a lot of people were saying, you know, what, what business has he got as the head of the Federal Reserve? talking about bubbles in financial markets. Now, I think he should have come out much more strongly and said, not my job to stop the bubble, but I believe <coughs> there is a bubble. I think the public would have taken that much more seriously. Now, after the crisis, you know, then you came to the crisis. Now, I think the Fed was culpable, along with Hank Paulson, of a, a catastrophic misjudgment in allowing Lehman Brothers to fail. I think that all the evidence of history, and indeed the evidence of long-term capital in the 19 in 1998, and then later the evidence that of the market meltdown that preceded the bailout of Bear Stearns only six months before, in March 2008. I mean, all those incidents should have made it very, very clear to the Federal Reserve and to Hank Paulson that it would, it would have been a disaster to let Lehman Brothers fail, as indeed it turned out to be. And so by making that decision, I think they made the, the economic crisis much, much worse and required a far more expensive bailout and stimulus of the economy. Uh, than would have been necessary had they rescued Lehman Brothers. Um, and then after that, once they realized they had made a terrible mistake uh, letting Lehman Brothers fail, I think the Fed um, actually behaved pretty well over this subsequent 18 months, that it has been uh, pumping money into the economy, it's been uh, getting the banking system back on its feet. And so in that respect, it's been keeping interest rates reasonably low. Um, so it's been doing a reasonable job. I still think that fundamentally we're in a mess, uh, that there are big reforms, as we argue, in the road from ruin that aren't being done. And as a result, there's still a danger that the economic recovery, recovery, if it happens, will be very muted and that we may drift on for years, a bit like Japan did in the 1990s. Uh, and the Fed has, you know, deserves some of the blame for that, although I think much less blame than Congress and the Treasury and Wall Street, who are all together uh, cooperating uh, in... Uh, not for making the fundamental reforms that are needed. Uh, what do you think of the idea to make corporations use externalities accounting methods? It's from Mitch DeVille. Well, 
I mean, this is a, an interesting idea that basically we all know that companies, um, they, uh, are a, they, they, they have an impact on society in various different ways. They pump pollution out into the air uh, through their, their productions. They, um, <coughs> they, uh, they can make a difference to uh, communities they work in by um, sort of do, using various uh, people, exploiting people or whatever. And they, we, we can actually start to measure some of these things. Um, and the externalities are when society doesn't uh, pri put a price on the, the assets that are, the things that are being used, like the clean air, for example. There, there's no penalty for a company to, to pollute, or there is a limited penalty. Now the question is, can you get companies to actually self-police themselves? I, d I think in ultimately it's going to require a threat of regulation. Uh, to force companies to actually take their externalities and internalise them. But I do think shareholders have already shown, and the public has already shown, that it does want companies to start being much more transparent about what they're doing. So there's been a huge movement in the past few years to actually measure carbon footprints in uh, public companies and to issue audited uh, reports on um, you know, on what they're doing, how much pollution, uh, how much carbon they're pumping out. And since they've started reporting on that, uh, it's been very striking that public pressure has uh, led to many companies saying, well, we're going to reduce our carbon footprint, we're going to go carbon neutral. And again, underlying that, I suspect, is a, a realisation that if they don't, um, the regulators will come in and force them to do so. And therefore, uh, the investors will uh, value those companies that seem to be recognising that uh, higher because it will be an indication that they're well run because the managers actually do think about where's regulation going to come in in the future and take preemptive steps to avoid it. So I do think more transparency is going to be the key to this and um, you know, companies are increasingly looking at uh, their supply chains and getting uh, non-profits to uh, evaluate whether the workers that are working for them are actually uh, being well looked after and properly paid and so forth. Again, that's going to be more and more something that we're going to ask questions about as investors in companies. Like, is their uh, supply chain well run? So I think um, we can't rely on it happening entirely on its own without pressure from government, but I do think that companies and governments can work together and will work increasingly well together to make this happen. What's your opinion of Ron Paul? I mean, He's, uh, you know, very uh, a national treasure, isn't he? I mean, he's like one of these people that uh, only Amer only America would have someone like Ron Paul uh, taken seriously in public and able to have a platform like that. I mean, I think the idea the idea that you could abolish the IRS and abolish the Federal Reserve, um, you know, both of those are ideas that tap into American history. Um, you know, I, I personally think that the uh, the, the, the fact that America resisted having a central bank for so long you know, actually uh, harmed it quite badly and that uh, America would be in a much worse situation now if it didn't have a Federal Reserve. Um, I think we'd all like to abolish taxes, uh, but um, I think dream on in that sense. Um, so, you know, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's fascinating to me that he can be someone who has such dedicated supporters. I once spent two hours being driven in a car by someone who was a wrong call and it was like uh, I've, I've never been evangelized by someone I thought quite so mad in my life but you know it was kind of interesting as a foreigner coming to America and uh, having these meetings uh, with people like this so I, I mean it's it's interesting more interesting that his son to me is now emerging as a political figure I was uh, reading over the weekend and uh, there are there are this sort of there, there is this trend and I you know I think the, the Ayn Rand view of the world um, which is being revived uh, by the, the economic crisis. That there, there, uh, and, and there are some real questions about um, the role of, of the government in the economy and the role of free market. Uh, but I think that a lot of this is about denial. It's about denying what really went wrong. And my, one of the things we, we say happens a lot throughout history, and we, 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 we've got lots of examples in the road to ruin, is that people do, after a crisis, go into d denial and come up with some pretty fantastic uh, solutions which would uh, have no positive uh, impact in the real world or no chance of really becoming policy. So in that sense I think Ron Paul is 
um, you know, but more about denialism and fantasy rather than a real uh, serious political agenda. Uh, I think that you've spoken a great deal of wisdom right there, and uh, there's an awful lot of, of uh, not just provocative, but also fascinating and intellectually uh, ag aggressive and exciting stuff in your book, which, by the way, is The Road from Ruin by Matthew Bishop and Michael Green, who unfortunately couldn't join us today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you here, uh, and uh, we look forward to your next book.